I'll just talk about a couple of house housekeeping things. Um, if you can, during most of the talk, uh, keep your mics um, muted if possible. Uh, yeah, a little. Um, uh, definitely, some, definitely banged up still. Uh, that's too bad. Reach that's being, too bad. I'm sorry uh, the, to hear that. If your uh, mic is what, not. What do you say about that? We will. Uh, yeah, terrible service right now. I'm to hear you. Uh, <laughs> I guess. That's the problem. <laughs> That we uh, so I muted uh, that person now, <laughs> and uh, when you um, do want to ask a question, of course, you have to remember to unmute yourself or use the chat box to the right, which would be great if you can do that. Um, I'm going to try to monitor what's going on in the chat box, and I'll try to feed Andy um, questions as we move on, um, and if. Any of you uh, are having a real difficulty um, communicating via chat, you know, feel free to unmute that mic and, and speak up. But Andy, chances are he won't be able to uh, react to the chat. So I will feed him the chat stuff. Um, thanks for coming. This is Sail Martha's Vineyard. Um, it's another one of our winter lecture series. The next one will be March 10th. Uh, we're working, uh, I've got a speaker that I think is going to be available, but he hasn't quite figured out yet if he could do it. So I'm not going to tease that out just to uh, disappoint everybody, but um, it would be a good one if we can do it. Um, it's a timing issue with him. So um, there will be one on March 10th. We're not quite sure what it's going to be yet, but um, watch for your email coming in from Sail Martha's Vineyard and uh, you can always uh, click on a link in there to sign up and give us your email and it will be via Zoom just like this one. Um, of course it's the season when we're signing up people for summer sailing and rowers are renewing their memberships and for all of these things, you have to be a member of Sail MV. Um, so for 2021, if you haven't yet done so, uh, please uh, renew your Sail MV membership, um, which is great. And that gets you, gives you the opportunity to uh, take part in one of our summer programs. Um, we have, of course, youth programs, 400 to 500 kids go through them every summer. And we also have adult programs. We have private sailing lessons in the afternoon. You can learn more about that by just clicking, clicking right at the top of our website. Uh, scrolling across the homepage is a nice link for signing up for summer sailing. Um, another link up there is about um, vineyard boating and it tells you all about the uh, different harbors around the island. And we're gonna be updating that as the se season starts to open up with more uh, fresh information, but there's info in there on uh, how to contact the harbor master in each harbor and uh, sometimes where you can anchor and where you can't anchor, pump out information, fuel information, all of that type of nice stuff is on our website. And we um, intend to keep that up to date. Your one-stop shopping for Martha's Vineyard sailing and cruising. We've still got some people uh, popping in now. There's a, a next wave is coming here. So I'm gonna keep chatting for a moment, but uh, Andy, are you uh, ready to get us started talking about uh, team racing? Yeah, I'm good to go, good to go, John. Okay, I'm going to uh, flip it over to you. I just you. selling my boat. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see if I can get this done here. Nope, it keeps moving on me, Andy. So I'm going to try it. John, you just keep host, and then you can let people in and out, and I'm sure I'll be able to do things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Andrew Nutton. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Andy Nutton. I'm the programs director of Sail MV. Uh, you might recognize me from such shows as the 2020 um, Seafood Buffet and Auction. Sorry, every speech I ever have to do, I need to get a Simpsons reference in. So there we go. Um, what we're here to talk about this evening is team racing. Uh, team racing is a little different from fleet racing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the basics of it, why we do it, how we do it, how we beat people, how we lose against people. And then if you've got any questions at the end, ask away. As John uh, said, if you do wow. have questions uh, halfway through or something like that, just drop them in the chat, send them to John, and then he can, um, he can back on from there. Okay, fantastic. So let's start. So here we are. And 
we're here to talk about team racing. Um, team racing has been around a very long time. In fact, we would have been uh, we would have been looking at some team racing at the Olympics uh, last year in a test venue, which would have been a two boat team racing. Um, so hopefully, we'll get to see that this year. Um, so it's team racing, um, it's all about the team really, rather than sailing either individually or with just two people. When we're looking at team racing, you've either got uh, uh, two boats or three boats racing together as a team. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, the first thing is, uh, what is team racing and why do we do it? So team racing is normally run between two teams of either two, three or four boats competing against each other around several different course layouts. Um, the winning team is either the team who doesn't finish last in uh, two, team boat, two, two boat team racing. If you finish last, then you lose, um, or with the lowest total points. The third one is races are normally really quick, taking around 10 minutes of race, uh, with a day's racing consisting of around 100 races before the semifinals and finals. In fact, the most races I've actually seen at a regatta um, was in the UK some years ago, it was the school's regatta, and we had 135 races run in a day uh, with two minute start sequences. Um, to say that it was manic is a slight understatement, but everyone managed to get eight races in a day. So I think you'd all agree that if, if you are team racing, you're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck, as they say. Um, team racing is fast and furious, relying on um, not only raw boat speed, which, you know, it does matter, but it's not the only thing. Um, but it also uh, takes fantastic boat handling as well as, as uh, an intrinsic understanding of the rules. Um, team racing is like trying to play chess whilst dancing the foxtrot whilst jumping up and down on a trampoline. So it, it's, it requires a huge amount of skill, communication, commitment, um, and a little bit of lunacy every once in a while. Okay, so the first things we need to worry about within team racing are the rules. Now, I, I'm a big advocate of knowing what the rule means. I'm not that interested in numbers and it, it's not something I want to go down that rabbit hole of sitting there going, okay, we're, all we're gonna worry about is the numbers. What we're doing is whenever you're team racing, whenever you're sailing really, <clears throat> it's all about making decisions. What kind of decision am I making? Why am I doing this? Whenever we talk to, whenever I talk to my students in the UK or the guys here, it was always at the end of a race or, 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 or an exercise, I go, right, why did you do that? And what that does is it, it gets it into the back of the head that they have to make, they're making a decision consciously, not unconsciously. We'll all do things day to day where we just sit there and you just do it, muscle memory, off you go. And within sailing, because especially guys who sailed a lot, they would do things just naturally. They wouldn't even think about it. And sometimes that leads to either acting too quickly or too late and, and, and looking at how to make a decision is really important. But in team racing, because the races are so short, so fast and furious, the, the rules are intrinsic to how you want to position yourself, how you want to position other people. Okay, so we're just gonna look at, uh, at six rules and a quick video. Um, so the first one is avoiding collisions at all costs. Now this is, this is pretty obvious, really. I mean, it, it, it's quite important that we don't. So let me just bring up a different camera. Now, hopefully this is gonna work. Now, can everyone see, thumbs up if you can see uh, the camera that I'm showing. You can see that, fantastic. Unfortunately, it seems to be a bit lagged out. So what I'm gonna do is I'll try this. Now you can see, great. Okay, so what I have here is I have my boats. Here we go. We've got a full team racing squad here. We've got our brown boats. Unfortunately, they've had a bit of a rough time. They've lost their jibs at the front. It's obviously a windy day. And we've got our black boats. Okay. And they're going to be racing against each other. And we're going to show, I'm going to show you how the rules line up against each other. So the first one is very simple. Avoid collisions at all costs. Okay, great. So we've got two boats coming in. This is happening here. Now we're gonna talk about port and starboard in a second, but obviously at some point, someone needs to move out of the way. These two boats are gonna crash into each other. If this boat is, and I've had this happen, like students sitting on the side, looking this way, looking out here, they've got no idea someone's sneakily coming up here. This boat cannot just crash straight into the side of them. It gets a bit emotional, um, it gets expensive. So this guy then has to tack. 
Okay, so we just avoid collisions at all costs. And we, we've seen that actually in the Prada Cup recently, which I'm going to go back to. So that's the first one and the most important one. Um, the other thing in team racing is if, for instance, to, uh, this boat has right of way and they turn up and hit them, well, they've broken avoid collisions at all costs. So, you know, they've broken a rule. So we as umpires, as it were, would look at that and say, wait a minute, this guy here who's turned too quickly has caused a collision. So this guy's in the wrong. OK, great. Uh, let's have go try. And, I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. Hop through. OK, next one is port and starboard. OK, well, port and starboard's pretty simple. Well, sometimes it gets a little bit emotional, but port and starboard is basically where you have two boats coming at each other, one on port, one on starboard. Here we go. So we've got a port boat here, starboard boat here. It's always where the wind's blowing from. And it's all to do with which boat has to keep out of the way. So this guy here coming along, this guy needs to make a decision. I've already stated that we need to make decisions in team racing. And, and, and this guy has a couple of decisions to make. They either sit there and go, okay, I'm going to be up high here. So I'm going to apply, okay, got to keep clear, everything tax. And now this guy is what we call lead bowing. This guy is in control, all right? Or he or she decides, actually, do you know what? I don't want to be over here. So I dip. And what that does is make this guy make a decision. Okay, so port and starboard, very, very simple. Just keeping clear going upwind. Downwind works exactly the same. Okay, we've got port and starboard boats. Port boat. Starboard boat like so. There we go. Let's have them coming in. Port and starboard. Again, they've just got to make sure they keep clear of each other. Um, the hailing boat, the, the, the stand-on vessel, doesn't have to scream and shout. Okay, now this is how <laughs> anybody who had children appreciates as soon as you introduce a rule bit in soccer bit, and as soon as they know that rule, they just scream and shout at everyone. What happens here, as soon as you get to high school sailors, it's just starboard, left, right, and center, you're turning around all over the place. There's lots of shouting going on. The really good teams, especially in this kind of situation, if this guy here is looking the other way, this boat will just come in here nice and quiet, shout starboard, or hail starboard just as they jibe, and then they'll go, wait a minute, you broke a rule and they have a little uh, a little uh, protest going on there. So port and starboard, very, very simple um, and doesn't have any real like difficulties to it because it is so clear cut. OK, fantastic. The next one. Is windward lured. OK, now windward lured can get a little bit tricksy, as uh, as um, Gollum used to say. In, in, uh, oh, no, wrong one in Lord of the Rings, all right, there we go. Okay, so windward lured. Now this is all to do with which boat is closer to the wind. There we go. Okay, so we're looking here, and this is, this is quite obvious. So here we have one boat here, one boat here. So black here is windward. So this boat, or is, we would shout in, in Europe, we would shout windward boat. In the US, you shout lured boat. Okay, so they're both exactly the same. <laughs> It's lost in translation, you know, come all the way over from England and shout and different rules. It's like, what's going on? Um, so you've got windward boat here. All that's happening here is that this boat has to keep clear of this boat, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about luffing in a minute, but it's basically any boat coming from windward, like so, has to keep clear of the leeward boat. Very, very simple. Um, now, that's pretty simple going upwind, like so, this boat can't bear away and crash into this guy. Now, downwind, the difficulty is, is who then is windward in this situation? They're both running downwind. The wind is here, by the way. They're both running downwind. Okay, so we need to figure this out. Well, what happens is, is when both boats luff, like so, is to see which boat now is closer to the wind. So in this situation, the black boat is to windward of the, the brown boat. Okay? Really simple, no real issues there. You're always thinking, what would happen if I luffed up? Okay, so always looking at which boom's going on. Now, what happens in team racing quite quick, quite often is you'll get someone to do a cheeky double jive, for instance. Okay, so they go to port, okay, 
port and starboard now. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go back. Uh, here we go. And there's nothing right's going on. But the windward lured thing is just make sure the boat to windward can keep clear. OK, now the good thing about being windward is that they can steal their wind, obviously. So if this boat's going here, we've got a wind shadow falling down. The wind shadows go a very, very long way. OK, so if you're fleet racing, for instance, and you've got your spinnaker up, you're going downwind, it's a beautiful day out in the sound, and you're chasing someone down, you know, it's the Vineyard Cup, it's the blooming pursuit race, and Starfish has been started an hour and a half behind everyone else. When I'm on that run, I'm just, like, sitting, even if I'm 20, 30, 40 boat lengths behind, I'm following that boat's stern so that I can cover them, OK? But then, obviously, when I come into this situation, Windward boat keeps clear and I have to be careful. Okay, cool. Right, the next one. The next one within team racing is, is, is difficult because it's all to do with your opinion of what's going on. So we've got room at the mark. Okay, now within fleet racing, it's three boat lengths. Within team racing, it's two boat lengths. Okay, so let's go back to here. When we're looking... There's my mark. Here it is. Okay. And I have my two boat length area. Now this tends to be at uh, mark two, three, and four. We're going to talk about the courses in a minute. But when the, the basics of, uh, of room at a mark is that we've got two boats coming in like so. Okay. This area is two boat lengths. If this guy, you can see he's now broken this line. There he is. If this guy doesn't have an overlap, so this boat, you can see here, he is clear astern. So if I draw a little line, there we go. This guy's desperately trying to chase on. He's like, come on, I've got to get in. I've got to get in, got to get in. Okay, they come up. He's broken this line. He's within the two boat length area. And this guy is clear astern. He will then, this boat, would just go no room, which means that even if this happens, now you can see, we have an overlap here or over the stern. This guy was already in the zone. Now this guy might go, room, give me room, let me in. But this guy now knows, well, wait a minute, I've said no room, you can't come in. Meaning that even if he pushes in, this guy doesn't have any rights, so he can go round. Now, obviously, there's a point at which if, if four, if the, the black boat is being really pushy, like they've, they've got out of bed the wrong side of the, uh, got, got out of bed the wrong side, they're gonna be really pushy. Discretion is the better part of Valor and team racing here, because this boat would then go, all right, fair enough. He goes in. Now, obviously, having the inside loop means you can go around the mark, and this guy would then protest, go, you can't do that, okay? This can happen now. The difficulty here is this situation, okay? So we've got a boat on port coming into, on starboard, sorry, coming into this mark. Now, if I draw this line, coming off here, you can now see that any boat, so this is, this is clear astern, this boat is astern, yes? Okay, any boat on this side is now ahead of that. It also means on this side that any boat on this side is ahead. So it doesn't matter if this happens, for instance, so this guy's here, if that happens, even if, this guy pierces, he is ahead, he's clear ahead, you see? So he's not coming from clear astern. So he now has room, okay? And you'll see this in a video later on about how, certainly at mark three, which is a lured mark like this, like a jibe mark or something like that, down, dead down wind line, you're going to have these curves, okay? And that's gonna cause a little issue. So room in the mark is one that there is a lot of screaming going on. Like lots, <laughs> it happens in big boats, in little boats, it happens all over the place. And it's a case of just, all right, what's going on? Okay, I think I'm clear. Now in this situation, I would always, and, and Andrew Burr, who's the high school coach along with me, we would always suggest to our sailors that the helm slides themselves back right on the edge here and just does this, no overlap, no overlap. That indicates that this boat, these guys know there's overlap, no overlap. It also means, that when you've got umpires on the water, that they are aware that the helm in this boat, in the brown boat, is making a call. They sit there and go, okay, cool. 
that person, that lassie who's driving that boat, she knows exactly what she's talking about. She's telling us that there's no overlap. So if this guy then pushes in here, then she's, we know what's going on. Now, a good thing to do here, a little sneaky sneaky, is to try and, um, is to try and like, you're not cheating the umpires, but convince them that something's going on. So in this situation, when you're miles out, you would go no overlap, hand down, no overlap across the back here. Now that means that, well, they've still got another boat length to go. They could get in and you're still saying that. So the umpires might think, okay, there was no overlap there. There can't be any overlap here. Okay, so you can kind of try and uh, sell your, your, your point of view to uh, your umpires. Okay, cool. The next one. I'm sure there's going to be some questions in a minute, but we'll um, just get through the rules first. Rights to laugh. Okay, so luffing is, 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 a, is an intrinsic part to the way in which you control boats within team racing. It's the way in which you can, um, can deal with people to windward of you, um, the way in which you can get people off your follow and those kind of things. Okay. But the thing to remember about luffing is it is the windward rule. So it's windward boat keep clear, but... It's when you have those rights. When am I allowed to love someone? Okay, all right. So here we are. We got our black boat going along and we've got our brown boat coming along here. Now remember in uh, the, 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 um, the room rule, we were talking about coming from clearer astern. So coming from behind like so, or being clear ahead. So what we do is we draw some lines straight off the stern and we're on the same kind of angle off the bow. You can all see that, great. Now what's happening here is we've got a faster boat. Now this could be going downwind, could be going up wherever, okay? This boat is coming downwind. Now the luff, this boat is thinking, okay, right, I'm in a bit of trouble here. I'm getting covered by this boat. This boat's stealing my wind, for instance, actually I'll do this. That's a bit more sense. Good. Okay, here we go. So we've got our stern coming off here. Great, this boat's coming in. Like so, both on the same tack. Okay, so there isn't a port and starboard. Let's just do that so he's safe. There we go. So they're both on starboard. Okay, now this boat here needs to make a decision. They sit there and go, okay, I'm wanting to get past this boat. I'm wanting to dictate what this boat can do. Okay, now downwind, as we all know, as I've already intimated, that, that this boat is going to be able to go faster than this one. Okay, so this boat needs to try and get this guy to come in here because as soon as they go up there, they come from clear astern meaning that this guy can then luff, okay? And they'll do this. And they can take them wherever they want. Now they can take them into wind, okay? This guy can't tack, but it, you know, that's disastrous for this guy. This guy then has to tack off. They can bear away and go where they like, okay? Now, so windward boat, this is the windward boat has to keep clear. Well, all right, fair enough. This guy doesn't want to do that. So he's like, all right, I want to go this way. But this boat is overtaking and it's come from clear stern. So they cannot luff them, okay? But because it's windward lured, these guys then can't start sailing off like this. So they have to sail their proper course, okay? So when it's talking about luffing, and we're gonna look at when boats have the right to luff and when they don't have the right to luff, and to see, you'll understand how difficult it then is to be an umpire within team racing because of when these overlaps are, are occurred. But the basics of it is if you come from a stern and you go to windward, get ready to luff up. If you come from the stern and you go to leeward, then you can't luff at all. You can't literally cannot luff at all. These guys must be allowed to sell their proper course, but they then can't start bearing down or bearing away, okay? I think there is a really famous video at the, uh, the 2000 America's Cup uh, between Italy and the US. I think the Italians had got over and they were coming down here and these guys, the Americans then came from underneath and they, the Americans kept going, you're bearing away, you're bearing away, you're bearing away. And eventually the Italians got pinged um, for doing that. They then later saw the tracker and Italy had, had held a perfectly straight course. And um, I think it was Kayard maybe had, uh, had just kind of sold his point really hard to the umpires and eventually they folded and, and given in to, the, uh, to, to those tactics and these guys had to do them. And they, okay, cool. Um, John, are there any questions coming up on the chat yet or not? Uh, nope, we're good to go. Great. Uh, as I said, if you do have any questions, just type them in or just put your hand up or, or shout at me. Okay, the last one um, is this one is rights of way. Now rights of way is 
has got lots of grey areas in it. It's got lots going on and, and, and it's quite difficult to, um, to see what's happening sometimes. But um, the basics of it are as follows. We've got, it's how have you managed to get control of a boat? Okay, so if we're sitting there thinking, all right, we've got port and starboard here. Great, no problems at all. This boat has right of way. Okay, but what can happen sometimes we're thinking about those rules. We're thinking about port and starboard, windward leeward, and then, uh, well, yeah, port and starboard, windward leeward. Let's keep those, these keep it pretty simple. Now, if this boat's coming in here, as I said before, black has to make a decision. And whenever you're sailing, to think about, to, to, to make a decision after having a, a, a cognitive process is really important because you might make the wrong one. But, and I've been caught out like this team racing before. So I'm sitting here in black, and I've got someone else coming out here. And Black wants to control the brown boat. So I sit and go, all right, what am I gonna do? I want to lead bow them. And basically what that is, is by it, it, you sit like so, and the wind coming off the back of your sail actually headers the boat below you. And you'll see it, and I'm sure some of you have, have experienced it. So two boats sitting like so, you're gonna have dirty wind, dirty air coming off these sails, and the wind is no longer gonna be pointing down like that. It's going to be coming off and actually going like so. So it's going to be headed and you'll end up seeing a boat not being able to hold their course. And as they go up, that's what will happen. And we'll leave out you. And that's, that's a really good way of dealing with people, of, of, of leading people in, as we say. But for you to then be able to do that or to be windward boat, as it is, lured boat, as you see here, is that you need to manage to complete your turn. So if I'm coming along here, I turn, keep turning, keep turning, keep turning. I need to have completed this turn in time for this boat, then after I've completed my turn, to be able to make a seaman-like manoeuvre to keep clear. Now, what happens quite a lot, especially with younger sailors, is they go, right, I've got to leave them in. Like, I've got to smash them. I'm going to, this guy's going to go backwards. We're going to win. You know, everyone's going to think I'm, I'm awesome. What happens is they come screaming in here. They tack. And they haven't quite finished their tack. And this boat now, this boat's obviously still moving forward. This guy who's starboard needs to keep clear. So even though they tack, now windward, got to keep clear, this guy hasn't attained his rights. He hasn't got, he hasn't got right of way yet, meaning that he has broken a rule. Okay, now that can happen all over the place. Now, the one we always see, and Andrew Burr and I had long discussions about this because um, I used to, when I was team racing or, or coaching te team racing many, many years ago, was that I would be coming in. So I'm brown boat here. Coming in, this guy would tack. Now you think port, starboard, no problems at all. I would then luff up to him like so. Starboard, bear away. And I would want to get this guy in trouble. Red flags, all, all sorts of mumbo jumbo going on. Okay, but what happens here, and this happens a lot, is that you'll get two boats coming into a windward mark, for instance, and we're going to talk about the windward mark in team racing later on, but it's, it's, a, um, it's a starboard mark around it. These guys are coming in. Okay, good, good, good. They tack. This boat's still moving. Now, as you see, this boat's proper course, so they're not, they can't laugh, they're sailing upwind on a close haul, is going to hit them. But they keep on that course. Obviously, this boat is going to clear, so you can see that. All right. So the only way that this boat could catch them is by luffing, okay, by moving. Now, you've got to give boat, the, the, the stand-on vessel has to give the other vessel an opportunity of keeping clear. Well, they're not because they keep moving. So there's no course to keep clear of. So as soon as you start to maneuver your boat, it doesn't give an opportunity this boat to tack out the way, for instance. OK, so what happens here is you get and this happens quite a lot with with umpires that are a little new to it. Um, they'll see this and they'll go, OK, great. There's a port and starboard here. No issues at all. They'll go up and as soon as that and they just go, yeah, that was a port and starboard. OK, and they'll bin this boat. This boat will have to do turns. But in fact, what has happened is that this boat has started to laugh, meaning they've moved their course, which therefore means that this guy here has no course to keep clear of. So they just go around. So if you've got anybody who's listening, who's doing some team racing, OK, you can tell them to be quite close this much, especially if they're going to team race and I'm umpiring. I'll be watching this boat's rudder. 
Okay, now if you're on a Firefly or a 420 or something, this tiller is very easy to see it move. You can see that move and it only needs to be a degree or three within about five seconds of, of the possible contact, which for me as an umpire, I would go, there's no way this boat can do anything other than go around that mark to keep clear. Okay, so when we're thinking about how you apply these rules, like how do you apply windward lured, for instance, you have to give people the opportunity. Now you're gonna see a video later on about the way in which two boats jibe, okay, clear. This boat jibes and heads straight up into this guy. Super quick, like within three seconds of the jibe being finished, there's contact. Well, there's no way this boat could maneuver clear out of the way within three seconds. Okay, and we're gonna have a little discussion of how the, um, how the umpires saw that. Okay, now, what else we're gonna look at now is the, uh, the America's Cup, the prelude to the America's Cup is going on in, uh, in New Zealand at the moment. Um, commiserations about that. The, the Italians and the Brits are gonna go at it this weekend, but there was a, um, there was a par, there was a, uh, can everyone see what you're looking at? Oh no, wrong one. Can everyone see two America's Cup boats there? I can yes, see, no. yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Okay, so this is the Prada Cup and it's the last race between uh, Ineos and, um, and Prada itself. Now I want you to think about what rule is, is being applied here. So the big talking point in this week has been this cross that Ineos Team UK made over Lunarossa Prada Pirelli. It was a really important situation you know, Ineos makes this cross, they're going to win the round robin series and go straight through to the Prada Cup final. As you can see here on the graphic, it's, it's really close and um, it really could have gone either way. Just remember, this is a port starboard situation, so that's rule 10. Starboard tack boat Italy has right away over Ineos, the UK boat there. Let's just go into the water and relive the action. It's going to be close, there, boy. Yeah. See you, man. See you. Yeah. Straight in if we're across. Okay, this is finished, boys. Okay. Down, eh? Yeah. Down, 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 down. Back now, please. Go on, go on. Stop it. Okay, so I'm going to take Italy in this situation. Stop attack. It's my favourite attack. <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm Sir Ben. Okay, so as we approach here, I'm calling starboard. What are you, what are you thinking right now? Well, as soon as the two boats jived, even though both boats are going 45 knots, I'm kind of used to this by now. I think I'm crossing pretty easy, so I'm really not that concerned. Back now, please. Go on, go on. Okay, but as we get closer, you know, I, I, I agree. You know, you were ahead at one point, but as we got closer, about 20 seconds out, I was starting to think I'm going to have a piece of you which means I'm going to make contact unless you get out of my way. Why didn't you judge? Well, there is a rule in my benefit here, and that's rule 16.1 that says that you, as the right-of-way boat, have to, at some stage, give me an opportunity to keep clear. Within about 10 seconds, the only way I can keep clear is to keep going across your bow or there's going to be a major collision. I'm continuing across, and I'm hoping that the umpires get it right. I think you're altering course. Right, well, let's we just zoom in a little bit on this picture. You can see the blue dots. That's the trail from behind my boat being Italy. Now, if you watch Spithill's hands now, he's the guy on the, you can see here, he's helming here, all looking to starboard. What they're doing, if you watch his hands, he's actually down, made down, quite down, a down, big bear away. Did you see that? Seconds, he makes I quite a big bear, bear away. On these boats, you know, the, the, the wheel's you. quite difficult. Now we've had the benefit here of looking at all this technology, and yeah, in the last 10 seconds, I brought bear away 14 degrees. How many degrees? 14. Okay, you're wrong. So that means that Richard Slater, the chief umpire, made the right call. I think Richard Slater and his team made Okay, cool. So it, the reason we show that is, or I've shown that, is, is that it isn't team racing, but... You can see that the, the rules that we're applying here, you know, the rights, gaining your rights, like keeping clear of people and those people who have the rights of, uh, of making sure that you, you give people a clear, 
a chance to keep clear is the same in team racing it is when you're racing around a race course at 50 knots on like million dollar um hydro falling boats okay but just to confirm that what we had here is we had uh, Prada here and Ineos. They're going along, like chugging along at major speed and, and, and Spithill's here going, I'm, they're going to clear us. So the only way he's going to be able to take a piece of them and, and convince the umpires he's doing something a little better away there. Okay, now I'm going to hit them. Big luff up, a load of Hollywood going on, like uh, lots of waves and stuff. And they miss them and there's a protest. Now, the reason, and this is the reason why Prada couldn't get at them, is that these boats are all working in apparent wind. So if they've got like, uh, I think they had 18 to 22 knots or 20 knots then, they were doing 40 knots. So they're going faster than the wind. So if you ever hit, stick your head out of a car, or you ever watch a Spaniel with his head out of the car, uh, driving along, those ears are flapping around there. They're working in apparent wind, which means, as you can see here, going downwind, their sails wouldn't be out, their sails are in. So the wind they're feeling, the produced wind they're creating as moving through the air column, means that they're actually quite tightly, re uh, tightly sheeted in. Meaning for the boat to go really fast, they need to be at this kind of angle, okay? But he knows that at that angle, they're going to miss them. But he also knows that he can't do this. Because if he comes off the breeze a bit, yes, at this speed, at 45 knots, he's going to get him. But therefore, his boat, as he bears away, his VMG gets a bit worse, and he ends up going slower. So any way he's going to miss him. So the only way that Prada thought they could get a, 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 a Ben and Ineos was the fact is they get close and then do a cheeky little bear away within 10 seconds and see if they could, like, you, you talk the umpires into it so that was a real and you know as as they said if you and i were to sit on a boat going at 50 knots our hair would be on fire and there was no way we'd be turning anything but these guys are so used to it that kind of maneuver um we're going to see more and more of that in the next couple of weeks as as we move on towards the Amer america's cup and hopefully um we'll see a lot more of that as which will be awesome okay cool um right so away from the rules any questions coming in for the rules john uh, no, no questions, uh, unless somebody wants to jump in with a voice here. Oh, okay, cool. Right then, there's the Enos Cup. Okay, so if a rule is broken, so if someone's been a bit cheeky, a bit naughty, okay, well, it's self-policing, sailing is self-policing. So all we need to do is make sure that we, uh, if you're hitting a mark, so, and then I presume you can all see my little camera as well. If you hit a mark here, you just go off and go, yeah, I've done that. And you just do yourself a 360. Um, if you hit someone to win, so if you're windward and you bump into someone or, you know, you, you pushed in or whatever, you've broken the rule and you know you've done it. Just put your hands up and go, yeah, 360. You wave at the umpire and go spinning. Okay. And you do your turns. Okay. But if, no one thinks anybody's broken any rules. Or if you are really late in the race, we'll get onto that in a minute, you, you're just going to keep quiet, which means that then the umpires are now going to start coming in. So someone thinks the rule's been broken, but no one's owning up to it. So a boat basically just raises a little red flag and just shouts protest. Now, they try, they're hailing the umpire. Now, when I'm umpiring, I'm, whenever I do a briefing for umpire, I'm right. Like, if you have an issue, you want to raise my awareness, you need to wave that red flag at me and, and wave at me and go protest, which allows me as an umpire to know what's going on. Because sometimes you can't hear, okay? So that's why we have our red flag. So the protest flag goes up. Okay, great. Um, and now as, a, as, a, uh, as an umpire, I've got to make a decision. So I've been watching what's going on um, and I think I know what's happened. So if nothing has happened, I just raise a green flag. It can be green and white. And that just means there's no further action required. So everyone just keeps sailing on and we just move on from that. Um, if someone has done something wrong, so they, they've, they've crashed into each other and the, you know, the mast's fallen down, something like that, then it's a 720 to the boat that has made the error. Now that can be the boat that has protested. So for instance, if, um, if uh, I'm in one boat and John's in another boat and John does something and I then protest, but it's actually my fault for the contact, then I will get the turns, okay? So anybody can get those turns and an umpire can give you uh, continuous turns until they feel that what you have done has been repaid. Um, on that point, if something you have done can't be made up 
with by the race continuing you just spinning on your spot so for instance you've illegally taken three boats out and your team go through and win one two for instance then the brat flag will be flown uh, the race will continue but then a committee will decide on shore and finally and one that happens over here a lot more than it does over in europe is a yellow flag which is carried by um by the competitors and if they don't dis they don't agree with a the decision then they can ask for that to be reviewed okay cool um let's see if that works no okay now the courses now we've talked about rules and how we how we do all sorts of things now so the courses the first one we have is a starboard n okay now you may have never seen this in sailing before it's short it's sharp what we end up with is with two starboard mark roundings at the top of the course and then two port mark roundings at the bottom and then a finish okay this gives you two beats a run and then two reaches okay another one and this is one we tend to use within training quite a lot because it's quite easy to set up is a port box okay you still got four marks you've still got a, a run and a beat and a couple of reaches um it would, this tends to get used uh, when you're looking to run two courses together. So you'd end up running a um, starboard box coming or a starboard end coming off this way a little bit and the port box would come off there. But they're the two main courses that we use. Right. So in team racing, when and which areas are races won and lost? OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick look at um, how and well, yeah, how, how races are won and when they're won. Um, so the first one is the start. Now everyone knows the start in racing is really, really important. If you have a wicked start, like you're first off the line, everyone's in your dirty wind, unless you really do mess up, you should be somewhere in the top, top 10%, for instance. So whenever I was coaching, uh, lasers or 29ers, we'd always sit there and go, okay, if you start in the, in the top 5%, so there's 100 boats in the fleet, you're fifth off the line. You shouldn't finish, unless something breaks, within that top 10%, 10, 15%, okay? But if you're starting in the bottom 10%, there is no way on earth you're gonna, you're gonna finish anything above the bottom 50%. So the start is absolutely imperative to being able to race properly, either fleet racing, team racing, or match racing. Okay, marks one and two. So we're gonna look at that starboard S course. Okay, so marks one and two, that little reach across the top is where some shenanigans go on. And then marks three and four. Now the last beat does have a lot of bearing and, and actually when we won the, when our MVRHS won the Cape and Islands, we won that through some very good last beat work. But it's, it, I'm, I, I think it's more important as a, as a basic understanding of how this all works that we look at these, uh, these three areas. Okay, great. So the start. Now I want you to think about what the start is, okay? And then we're just gonna have a look at the three things that you want to pay attention to. Okay, so the start. The start line is normally for yacht sailors would be unbelievably small. Like you would all be like, there's no way you can get boats along that line. So here we are, and that line is, is small. Okay, now what we have to do, and you, this works for anybody racing, what you're looking at doing is splitting up your line, okay, and trying to figure out where you want to start. So the first bit was pairing up, okay, so what you can do is you can sit there, now if you've raced these guys a lot, for instance, so the black and the browns have raced each other forever and a day, we know three here, this boat is our best sailor, and this guy here is his best sailor, we pit those, this guy's just going to follow him around and try and like wreck his day. OK, and then that will then disseminate through the rest of the fleet. So you can pair up. The other thing you can do with a start is you can just kind of have zone startings. So this line here and this line here are our lay lines into these marks. And a lay line is very simply the, the lowest position you can go to be able to still make this mark on a close haul. If I'm down here, I'm having to pinch. I'm not going to be able to do it. Here, it means that if anybody's below me, and then the gun goes and they've come from a stern, I'm still going to clear this boat. Okay, so we've got this area to work in. Now we've got three boats. So what we want to do is give ourselves three zones. So we then just go. And we're always working on our ley lines. Okay, now we've got to think 
all right, we're thinking about these areas, right? Who's going to start where? Well, the one that requires the best starting ability, the one that requires this timing to be inch perfect is this end. So you tend to have your best starter down here. The, the guy or the girl who's really always hits the line on go, it's like, awesome at it, um, starts down here somewhere, hits that ley line, works their way up and boom, off they go. Brilliant. Okay, and the other advantage of starting here is that if someone is here, you could then pinch them off. You could leave bow them again, as we already said. Now, what you can do in team racing, what you can do in any boat, is you can have your boat like so. And then if you roll it to windward slightly, you're actually increasing. The, the mast is no longer pointing straight up. It's actually pointing out at this angle a little bit. And that's going to cause more draft going onto these cells. You can also do all sorts of things with these cells. But that, that works really well. Okay, this end... Now, if anybody's ever done any racing, especially beginner racing, you all know that this end is like an absolute bun fight. It's like a scrum in rugby. Everyone just kind of gets in there screaming and shouting. So this end is the end with the, the guy or the girl who really likes a good fight, likes, likes to get stuck in, likes to really knows the rules, is really good at manoeuvring the boat. Their boat handling's really good. They can slow down, speed down, speed up really well. So this, this guy or girl is the one who really likes a good fight. And then this one is just the last of your boats. Okay, now the perfect start for team racing is at go is that, okay? Perfect start, okay? You've got three boats. And as we've already said, if these guys are in these kind of positions, then this race is pretty much done, okay? The number of times I've seen like good teams have a good start like this and they've won one, two, three, they've just disappeared into the distance because these guys can't get anywhere near them, okay? But obviously in this situation, well, all right, well, this guy wants to be under here. Okay, he's gonna do that same to this guy. Maybe this guy's a little low, so this guy can come in here. And possibly this guy's gonna scoot through and then disappear off in the distance this way. So looking for your positions is, uh, is really uh, important. And the last one is time and distance. Okay, now we talk about this, and if you watch the America's Cup, if you watch the Prada Cup, you'll see these boats are moving so fast that sometimes, especially when uh, in the semi-finals, when uh, American Magic and Prada were going against each other, um, both boats a couple of times were miles off the start. So gun is now, they were miles away. So what they've done is, is, is Prada sometimes had just decided to take American Magic over here, but other times they hadn't got their timing right. So if you've got a team, we'll concentrate on this boat, this boat is awesome at timing, like they always get it right. If they go, go and their bow is just short there they get a fantastic start they're boats that know their time and distance their, their, their speed and distance now what tends to happen is what happens a lot with beginners either fleet racing or team racing is they disappear off to tipperary over here somewhere they're like like a minute and a half away they're like right it's taken me in a minute to get back here so they disappear another minute that way they tack well the issue with that is if the wind dies it's not going to take you a minute it's going to take you like a minute and 10 seconds. So all of a sudden you're 10 seconds late. So when we talk about, certainly when we start in, uh, coaching, starting, what I like to tend to do is we look, at how, we look at how teams over here rotating in a clockwise manner. And the reason we rotate in a clockwise manner is it means that you're going into this on starboard. You're driving, uh, you're driving on, uh, off port onto starboard. Okay, so you then have rights. If you go the other way around, you're jiving down into port. It's not quite so clever. So what we'd end up doing, and you might have seen this if you remember the old America's Cups, they used to just go round and round in circles together, didn't they, before they start started. We would teach boats to spin off here, and then this guy, for instance, would be our pin end. We go, all right, this guy's got a make decision. So he would go first, then the boat coming around here would go second, and then this boat going last would go last here. And it's all about figuring out where you are on the start and where that timing works. Okay, cool. So we've got some videos now. So let's have a little look. Right. So these videos are taken in the UK and over here from uh, different drones. Okay, so what we've got here is, um, is a start in very light winds. Now you can just about see at the bottom, but this is like a, uh, <laughs> this is like a licorice also it's like a pick and mix of disasters going on here because you can see down here you've got um uh windward lured going on here between the red and the blue boat okay blue's just jibed into a windward position of red meaning that red has every right to to to, to go towards them okay so blues put themselves into a horrible position Red then bears away. You can see the red down here has just borne away. All right, fair enough. So this guy now really should be doing some spins. But at the same time, 
with blue like really not doing his mates any favors red here is just tacked onto port so blue over here you can see here is just going right sunny and he lines him up okay you can see that boat isn't maneuvering red's doing a, oops a minute red's doing all sorts of shenanigans I knew that happened red's doing all sorts he's maneuvering around too much blues had to maintain so we've had two protestable issues within you know five seconds there okay well well let's keep going a bit longer and have a little look so we've had a windward lured and we've had a starboard okay now the perfect example of giving people the opportunity to keep clear is this one so blue is coming from a stern on red this is a red boat here okay great now what blue should do is blue should just go this way a little bit okay should just go that way okay but instead you know they're teenagers they've got a hot head you know they, they love a little they love a nice little crash um they need to keep clear but they don't and what they do as you'll be able to see here is they come in and they just laugh straight away like there's <laughs> there's no chance of this boat getting clear at all oops there's no chance of this boat getting clear at all and they just hit straight into them now you can see there the hands went up so the umpire jim's back here and he's umpiring he's going to have to make a decision in a second okay now you can see here that this guy is definitely going for the pin this guy is going to be going into this region the blue here is looking to control the committee boat and i mean this guy's in the middle of nowhere to be honest okay so let's have a little look see how it turns out okay red starts starts reasonably well blue's got a good start blue down here is doing a spin for for uh, uh windward lure that went on here now this guy hasn't made a call but jim there has just raised the red flag and this guy's going to do his 720 okay now in that situation this guy here should have done a turn nice and early done a 360 because you can see it's quite light winds so he needed to do that turn early doors so that there he didn't just get swallowed by this guy which will happen in a split second and what you don't want on a team on a team racing race is a uh, is a rowing shell coming into the middle it gets a bit emotional when they turn up okay so start two now we can see we've got a bit more breeze going on here so the starts much more separated okay there's there's boots coming in but we've got this guy down here that for my bet is a little low okay now remember we talked about ley lines we talked about the way in which um here's our ley line we talked about this ley line being here and I reckon the ley line's about there. So he's right on that ley line, okay? So he, he might stand or she might stand a chance of not getting towards the start. Now, the other issue here for this team here is this boat. I don't know what that boat's doing down there, but let's see and let's see how we get on. Come on, let me start. Come on, I need to do that, sorry. Okay, that's that start. Go away. There we go. Okay, so we've got them coming in. Now remember that lured boat, that red lured boat, we were worried about that boat making it. Now you can see the first, the first windward boat, this boat here has managed to squeeze off, managed to get going, but you can see there just by being below the ley line that this guy now is in all sorts of trouble. It's breeze on, what you've got here is you've got now you've got blue 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 red leading but this guy's to windward of it and this guy leading it just because this guy didn't tack earlier or jibe earlier and come in and, and come over this way it's given blues a really good chance of winning this race okay and you can see very quickly in fact there's a header there and this boat isn't going to make it either um you can see by the angle of the boats so the awareness of where your your um your ley lines is absolutely imperative in the manner in which you start a race okay cool start three okay so here we are again now you can see here we've got a little bit of shenanigans going on here so red has just left and made red a uh, blue tack off that's okay blue was too high so needed to keep out of that zone we're coming in here now we've got blue my apologies So blue down here is looking to hook, okay? And what that means is getting their bow underneath their stern. You can see there, okay, hooked. This guy goes, all right, fair enough. I'm just gonna tack off, gonna go round. There's a lot of rotating here and you can see they're rotating in a clockwise manner, which is good. All right, so we've got 
These guys are going up towards this point here. Okay, so there's a bit of windward lured there, a bit of shenanigans, doesn't want to be there anymore, so tax off. Okay, brilliant. So this guy down here has now got the whole run of this area. So we're, we're looking here, let's have a little draw. We've got our ley lines here and here. Okay, so we've got, this guy's a little high, but he's, he's not too bad. This guy's fully in charge and there's all sorts of stuff going on over here. Okay, cool. So let's uh, get rid of that and that. see what happens okay so they're all starting to line up the two red boats are pretty low here he's tacked okay what he's going to do there is just trying to come up a little bit to make sure he can still leave out doesn't get too separated away from him now the issue at the moment is that we have here this red boat is now getting dirty wind off his own boat meaning that he's not going to make that magical ley line which is here like so so we think that's a bit low but then he, this is the ley line that we're worried about okay cool they're coming in they're coming in they're coming in see the way he <laughs> my apologies there we go there we go so you can see now this line's still in position we're coming along and he's, he's dropping down. That bottom boat is dropping down. You can see just there. You can see now that his heading is so low, there is no way they're gonna make this point. So a decision, you know, we've already said about when do we make decisions, okay? So we always say to our students, right, if you're gonna do anything, ask a question of yourself at 40 seconds, can I start? And if you can't, there's no way this guy's gonna ever start. Okay, so that person needs to go, all right, fair enough. I either tag, well, that's a bit dubious, or I jibe, come into here and see if I can split off and catch up going starboard. But you'll see here, as this boat goes on, way low, way low, way low, still way low, has to pinch up. He's now on port, tax, hits the mark. I mean, it's, it's, he's done a bit of everything there, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's lower the line. He's managed, he or she's managed to hit something. I mean, just by not making that decision early enough, has caused them an issue with a start. And actually what should happen is this red boat should then just do a spin, just come down, tack, uh, jibe, tack, and off they go again. The other issue here is that this rope boat, by not giving themselves a proper situation of coming off here, have got themselves in a right pickle because this boat's now to windward of them. Okay, and you can see blue's now split perfectly, cover, cover, out in fresh breeze. So blues have really won that race. And you can also see that there's a massive shift um gone left so going left is going to really hurt these guys and the great thing about having a drone is that you can actually see these angles okay cool and on to our last start now the last start is 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 really quite something okay so we've got here what we got here is we've got <coughs> there we go we have a windward lured going on here so they have to be really careful about what's going on so there's a little luff all right, fair enough. Now, what you can see is here, you can see there's actually a gap. All right, so what this guy needs to do is go, all right, I can't be here. So I need to just roll the boat, pump, and shoot ahead a little bit, get a bit of distance. But they don't. They just sit there and go, all right, fair enough. Here we go. These guys now, these guys now will pop up. You can see they can just pop up. See the way they popped up now? Okay, great. Uh-oh, all sorts of trouble going on here. Can't stay there, I've got to tack out, okay? The issue is they then tack out, they tack to their own boat, they hit their own boat, which then makes this boat hit. So you can see there, just one bad decision can, can destroy a star. And that was a real compound. So this boat here, if they just squeezed up a little early, like anticipated that maneuver from that red boat, they'd have shot forward and not had an issue. Okay, cool. And that was, that, that's a really, that's a really bad start. But what I'm getting at here is that you've got lots going on and you have to make your calls earlier. And actually, if you see here, you've got any of our students watching, they'd be able to tell you, okay, right, red split, blue will tack here, red will tack as well. And the race is, the race is actually over because this guy will just cover him up wind, nowhere to be seen, red, red, cleaned out. And that's that. Okay, cool. So that was starting. Next one. Now I can't get it to come off starts, can I? 
uh, is mark one and two. So when we're thinking about, we've done our start, so we're working our way up the beat now. Again, we're looking to control the zone. So actually in the area in which we're doing our rotation, so that mark, that mark one um, and mark two rule about room. Working back, so if you're ahead, you need to like squeeze back if you need to get people to catch up. And then a mark trap. Okay, so marks one and two. Now, these are either in the UK or they are in the US here. OK, so what we can see here is we've got a red boat slowing down. Now, what they're in this zone, they're already in the zone. OK, great. So they're trying to these are two blue boats. This, this guy's trying to deal with him. Now, this is this was one of the worst moments. Of my that tack there was the worst moment in my career because they as a coach, they tacked. Now they've got to do a big turn. This guy has then got under here. Yes, they've come from a stern, so they can't laugh. They've basically just gone from two, three, which is a, a good position, to one, they're probably third there. Okay, this boat then tries to laugh, misses them, allows these guys in, meaning that they are allowed to sail their proper course. So one bad move there, one just getting too tight into here, caused them to go from two, three, to uh, back down to now four, five, and six. Okay, and my hair was being pulled out on that one. That was that was really really bad maneuver, um, and it cost us a. Uh, this was in the UK. It cost us a big championship. That one, which really wasn't particularly great. Okay, and you can see now that they've all moved on and, and it's and it's and it's progressed out. Now you've gone to a uh, one, two, three. These guys are all ahead and and they're in a good position. Okay, coming up, we've got the windward mark here. Okay, now if you saw there that this boat has come from clear astern, they pushed in. All right, so what we're doing now is we're applying room. All right, fair enough, let's have a little look at room. So we're in here and this guy desperately has to make sure that he breaks clear of this boat to be able to get around that mark first. So let's just have a little look. We've got a one, two, three here basically. Now this guy should be luffing to slow them down and allow them round, okay? Holds them off. Now this, remember this, we were talking about rights to, to go round. Okay, good. Now you could see here, this boat attacked, but you can see just by this follow that this boat has changed its course. So this is this uh, attaining your rights, making sure you, you give someone an opportunity to keep clear. And this guy <laughs> absolutely has, he's just kind of luffed straight up into them. And this guy's got nowhere to go, can't, literally can't keep clear. So what should happen there is this boat now should just shout protest, okay? Because they have lost their position in the race because of this guy pushing in basically and causing a port starboard at this mark, okay? So that was a really good, and this guy's doing his spins, which was, which was crazy because this guy maneuvered. So it's that case of keeping clear, you have to give someone space to keep clear. So if you're moving up to them, they can't keep clear. It's a bit like if you, you know, if you chase after someone, they can't get out of your way. Right, now this, is in uh, Hyannis uh, in 2019 at the Cape and Islands. Now you can see here, we've got a number one boat. This is Joe Serper coming up, um, nice ahead. He's coming in on, on starboard, so he's got control of this. Now this is Andrew Burr recording this. Uh, he was new to recording, so it might be a bit dubious, but he's coming in here. Okay, Joe's ahead, great. He doesn't want to just sail off into the distance because if you look here, Joe's red, reds are here, so they're, they're best off fourth and they're back here so joe needs to do some work here joe needs to really earn his earn his pay okay so he's slowing himself down you can see he's slowed down and the most important thing for joe to do is to make sure he gets to that zone and then controls it okay so now we've got a situation where there we go okay so we're looking here and we've got one three four so it's looking pretty good for the vineyarders off we go OK, but you can remember that this guy here is to windward. So there's a little luff going on here, slowing him down, slowing him down. Probably I'd been a bit more vicious there. I would have luffed up a little bit more. But of course, Joe has stopped. Joe's in the area. So anybody who decides to go inside Joe doesn't have room. OK, so let's see what Joe does. You're just at the bottom of the frame, I'm afraid. There we go. Slows down, slows down, meaning that this guy now... Do you see the way? Do you see the way that Joe had managed to compact the whole fleet there really nicely? Oop. So Joe had managed to get the fleet. You can see how it spread out it is here. He comes a bit closer. Now everyone squeezes in. So this is what we call working back. 
Okay, so Joe slows down, the whole fleet compresses, and it, he's done a fantastic job at doing this. And, and I, I, we go on to win this race quite handily. Okay, but you can now see that everyone's compacting. All right, and this is all due, due to Joe slowing down. Okay. Okay, and you can eventually see that they all go around the mark. And then we have a windward lure. Now, these are the really difficult ones for an umpire. It's where this has been attained from. Has this boat broken the overlap? It comes up. Now, what should happen with the reds and what we told them was that this guy should have luffed really hard, broken the overlap and borne back down again. And this guy couldn't luff. OK, but, you know, we have issues with uh, those kind of things. OK, coming in for another port and starboard and, and a mark one. OK, cool. So you can see here we have a boat coming in on starboard. They have control over these two boats here. So they're definitely number one. OK, this boat's trying to keep clear. This guy's tap below. Now, coming up, coming up, coming up, we've got starboard here, port and starboard here. Now, this is where communication comes into it. And we don't, we, sailors, we don't really think about communicating outside of what we're, of our own boat. But here, all this boat needs to go is, and call a code or whatever they say, and saying to this boat, all right, you need to duck here. Because what I don't want you doing, I don't want to take this boat up and this boat get caught up. But let's see, see if they communicate. Okay, yep, there we go, dip down. So that's a nice little takeout. Perfect. The issue here is, is that Blue's coming in and doing all, so he's, he's caused all sorts of trouble. Tacked into the overlap, so this guy can now luff if they wanted to. Gets out of the way, does a manoeuvre. It's, it's all over for these guys. So you can see just by that little manoeuvre that happened there, we managed to convert 1-3 into a 1-2-3 very neatly, which was awesome. And they did a great job. Joe had to do a turn, I think, because he hit the mark. But that didn't really make a huge difference to how we were doing on that. OK, last of all, marks three and four. Now, this is where you can get like um, massive log jams. And that makes it really difficult for umpires um, because you're trying to figure out where everything started. And start, some things can start at the windward mar uh, at mark two and cause us huge amounts of issues. But again, with mark three, we're looking to try and control the zone. Control Mark 3 zone and Mark 4 if you can. A Mark trap, whether it be Mark 3 or 4. And then, um, and then working back. And at Mark 4, we have kind of like the Hell Mary, the last move of the game, which is the jive down, which, which can cause all sorts of uh, hullabaloo. Okay, cool. So... Here we are again at the same Cape and Islands. Now, remember, we're talking about rules. It's the, it's the whole thing's based on here. Now we're talking about, I mentioned two boats jibing quickly. So we've got here a Dartmouth boat jibes. Okay, the jibes are complete. Now you can see, and this is Joe Serper down here. There he is. He's just jibed, okay? And he literally just jibed. You can still see the wake off the back of the boat. Okay, great. He is lured, this guy's windward. So Joe has control of him. OK, but this guy doesn't want that to happen. Six here wants to get at Joe, wants to get at Joe in number three. OK, so he jibes immediately. Now, we can see that Joe has already started to keep clear. He doesn't have to keep clear until the guy's on his new course. But Joe has decided, I don't want to get caught out with this. I'm not sure what the umpire is all about. So I'm going to make a move. But this guy keeps luffing into him. Now, I think you'd all agree there is no way that red three, that Joe could possibly kept clear of that. There was no way. This guy then protests, and unfortunately Joe gets binned because the umpire was thinking, okay, it's a windward lured um, or port and starboard actually. They should have got clear. So it, it, it's a really tricky one. And that for umpires is, 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 isn't that hard. Now, as we work along, you can see Joe here gets, gets a little bit, he gets a rum, rum deal here. We, we're gonna zoom in. Okay, now. What we've got, Joe's done his turns. Now, this is Mark three. This is that lured Mark, okay? Now, if you look here, we've got Miles, our Milo Wolf, okay? Does a little jive. He's looking to control the zone, okay? So now he's in that zone. So it's his. No one else can have that zone. No one can go beside him. No one can go around him. And he's got room on his side, but he's also, this guy's on port. So he, <laughs> this guy doesn't have room and he's, he's on port. So he's got nothing going for him. He's like, a, he's like a, a, a bike with no wheels. He's got nothing going for him or a saddle. Um, he's coming in here. Mars is sitting there. Okay, great. No problem at all. Port, starboard. Get out my way. Miles kept a very straight course. And what happens there? Whoops. What happens there is that Miles should just 
Ooh, my apologies. Oops. Where are we? Oh, we've gone on that mark. Really sorry. There you go. This guy here should then have done a turn and it should have gone from what is looking pretty unpleasant for, for the, the vineyard is with one, five and six is this guy six should have been spinning over here, which all of a sudden changes the outcome of the race, uh, changes the way the race works. And actually, and as I said already that Mark uh, four to five is really important, uh, four to finish is really important sometimes is we went on to win this race due to some really good work from miles. Okay. I'm aware of the time. You can see here that, that these guys should have tacked out. There's all sorts of things going on. Here. Okay, so another downwind. What we've got here is we've got the boats and they're not really doing much. Okay, what I'd like to see here, you can see you've got uh, this blue boat should be flat on this guy. Should be really covering them. The marks here. Okay, let's keep going. It's getting a bit more, it's getting a bit tighter here. Okay, so we've had a jive. Now this is Zach. Zach's coming in on, uh, on starboard. These guys are all on poor, okay? So what needs, this guy really needs to make sure we're one, two, we're not losing, it's a good combo. They just need to get around this mark really nice and neat. But you can see just by, and Andrew goes a little too far, but you can see that they go a long way out and that gives them a chance of just getting themselves into a little bit of a pickle. Okay, if they've been a little bit closer, a little bit more, you can see the gap here. This is a terrible mark rounding. You can see that it's given these guys the opportunity of getting back at them. Okay, cool. Now, this is uh, at the Worlds in Rutland in England a couple of years ago. Okay, and this is a mark three here. So they've got the mark trap going on. You've got your zone here. This guy is on starboard on the port hand side of the course with this guy all the way over here. All right. now. There's another boat coming up in a minute, but you can see, all right? Now, look what happens, slow down. So he's controlling the zone. They're in the zone, they're like, okay, we're in the zone, I'm gonna control it. I don't want, they don't want this blue boat going round. They wanna make sure that this guy can get in. He's controlling him, all right, fair enough. So they want to kick him out and allow him in. So they go out, they get the little luff, they jibe, they come back, okay, great. This guy's now got room on here, so he can go in. Now, remember that this guy is gonna go round here, it's going to sneak around the mark. It's very light winds. They let them in, but because they've come from clear astern, these guys can then luff. And you can see here, the mark is over here. Mark four is over here. You can just about make it out. They've gone around. But you can see the course that this guy is taking him, luffing him out, luffing up, luff up, thinking, okay, I need to get this guy to come through. Because you can see up here, blue is one. First and last, you don't want to be last or you're losing. So blues are losing at the moment. So this guy's got to slow him down. So a little luff. It's not particularly aggressive. No one's screaming and shouting at each other, but they are keeping them clear. They're getting them out of the way, which allows this guy to go through. Okay, well, right, fair enough. So they've done a great job. This boat here is like, mm, I don't, I don't like this. These orange jibs. I can't, I can't have that happening. I, I need to do something here. So Mark Force here is slowing down a little bit, thinking, what can I do? What can I do? Okay, you can see up here, these guys have just stopped. They're waiting for it to go on. Okay, I've got the zone, but I need to get I need to get my guy out. I can't get my guy out. So I've got to get this guy back. So I'm going to go really high. And this is the Hail Mary. And you can see here the marks here. Think about this. This is two boat lengths. So it's about four boat lengths away in like looks like five to seven knots. Do a jibe. Slows down, slows down, sheet right in jibe. OK, great. Didn't do anything. But he's compressed this up quite nicely. Now what we can see here, the boat does the same. In he comes, slowing down, jibes down, thinking, all right, maybe I can come in. Can't, this guy then luffs. Okay, now these, these are the, um, I think this is a British, Britain, uh, Britain, Britain, they're the two British teams racing against each other. Uh, they're the youth team. So these guys are under 18, so they're pretty good. And you can see here that they, it's all worked out. But there were two nice little jibes going on there. All right, now this, as the final video, is, uh, is Great Britain versus the US, okay? And it's going downwind towards the uh, towards Mark III. And you can see there's a lot going on here. Okay, so we've got the blue boats out front, uh, looking over, sitting over on the port hand side, going, all right, fair enough. I've got these two boats to windward. Now this one isn't in a particularly great position. They're like, mm, I don't like being over here. There's a bit of shenanigans going on back here, trying to just squeeze back because one, Three, one, two, they both win. You get, you're looking for the lowest possible points. Um, so they're not too bad, but this guy has to make sure he's last. Okay, cool. So let's see what happens. Coming down, big luff. It's going to slow himself down a bit. Lots of rudder movement you can see there from two. 
The, hell, the main's right in, slowing right down. Okay, so he's in the zone now. Okay, so he's controlling the zone. No way that this guy can come in. This guy can't come in either because he's going to have to go around and port. So this guy has, has room, uh, doesn't have room, uh, controls the zone. So the, 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 uh, the American boat behind doesn't. And this guy's now on port. But he's done a good job because he spat this guy all the way out, meaning that him, the other American boat, can attack him. So let's see how that goes. He comes in, comes in, comes in. Okay, makes him laugh, slows everything down. Okay, goes around. Now, what's happening here, these guys have decided, okay, I couldn't get at him, so I'm just going to slow him down and spit him out the back. Okay, you can see here that he's gone high. He's gone a little bit high to give himself some space, which is nice. Okay, so it's pretty compacted down now. They're all slowing down. It's all going to work its way out at Mark IV. Okay, so this guy has come from a stern. So there's a bit of luffing going on, but obviously this guy's come from a stern. So everyone's luffing up, all right? This guy down here, five's done pretty well, hasn't he? He's managed to sneak in. So actually they've gone from one, three to uh, one, four, five, really, blues. So the, the, the light blues have done well. Blues laughing here, a little up shout, get out my way, please. All following up. Now, what we've got here is a slow down. They're all slowing down, compressing in. They're to lured, so that's fine, can't do anything. Let's see if we get any uh, any shenanigans. Nope, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. Look how slow this boat's gone because he's compressing down. He wants this boat to get involved, okay? Now let's see if this boat does anything. Okay, so they've compressed. There's gonna be some tacking going on. Now they're on starboard, so they can't get in front of them. There's the jibe. And what's happened there is you can see all of a sudden we have a port boat and a starboard boat well, port and starboard, that's not going to end up. There's a little protest there. What's going on? No room. So green can't get in. Lots of maneuvering, lots of shenanigans going on. And eventually the blue team do come out and win. OK, right. Excellent. Now, what we've done there, we've looked at loads of videos. We've looked at what's going on and how the application of rules and how it all works. With team racing, the thing is, is to make sure that you know two or three things. One, you know the rules and how they apply. Two, you know what the boats in your team are doing. And three, you know why you're doing something. You can't just sit there and go, hey, I'm just going to make a tack here because I like it. Look, I want to go over. You've got to make, okay, why am I tacking here? I'm tacking here because I want in two minutes time to be on the starboard hand side of the course so I can control mark one. Or actually, I'm going to come out here on port a bit more because I know there's a lift. So it's not just rules and tactics, as in tactical rule, rule application to influence tactics. It can also be the more traditional of, I wanna go over here because I get a lift, or I go over here because I get a bit more breeze, okay? Fantastic, well, if you have any questions now, please do ask up. Um, I hope you've really enjoyed that. As I said, there's loads of information. Um, the RYA, the Royal Yachting Association, has loads of links on their page, and the UK Team Racing Association. I know I've mentioned two um, British websites there. Um, that UK team racing is, is full like team racing nerds. They love it. They live for it. Um, and there's loads of videos on there. There's loads of coaching things. There's the cool book, which is produced by the Royal Yachting Association as well, which gives you all the rules and situations that umpires have found themselves in and then gone back and milled it over. How did you get out of that one? What did you ask there? What rule applies? Okay, but if anybody has a question, now is the time to, uh, to ask away. Andy, uh, one quick question. What's the rule on, um, you know, doing your 360s or your 720s? How much time, I mean, you know, in other words, sometimes you can't do it immediately or else you're gonna cause a mess, you know, a collision. <laughs> You have to do it as soon as possible. So for instance, if you do it on the start line, you clear, you clear that if you've hit the, yeah, if, you've, if, you, uh, if you're a windward boat, you hit someone on the line, then you basically have to allow them to go past you and then do your turns as quickly as possible. Um, as you're doing your turns, if you get in the way of someone else, then, then that's an issue for you again. So it's as soon as you possibly can. It's not like in, um, in match racing where you have to do it by the end of the leg. You have to do it as soon as possible. If you don't do it um, quick enough, uh, you just the umpire deems you've taken you know you, you're trying your arm you can get another one what umpires tend to do uh, is they hold their flag up until you've completed because actually you need to do two tacks and two jibes and sometimes people will just do a uh, attack a jibe attack and then just luff back up again or downwind they'll do a, a, a attack jibe tack but they won't finish that final jibe okay 
Um, There's a question uh, regarding the um, America's Cup uh, boats. Uh, have any rules had to change given the high speeds of the boats? Like it's certain... more to do. With, it's more to do with their their outriggers, Howard. It's more to do with you know movable bits. Because um, obviously, when you're looking at uh, room specifically as well, it's the boat in its proper setup. Um, now, this was something that when asymmetrics came out, um, so an asymmetric boat, uh, especially dinghies, has a retractable pole that just spits out the front. And all you do is pull the halyard and thing goes, dunk, and then the, the kite goes up. Um, the earlier boats, so like something like an RS400, for instance, had, an, had a, an, a separate launch pole. So the pole would come out. And then you would go around the windward mark and hoist. So they had to figure out, well, when was the pole meant to be there? And they figured out that actually within about four boat lengths. Now within the rules with to do with when your foils are up and down, it's just considered when the foil in is its proposition, proper position. The speeds is just to do with how big that area of giving, uh, giving time to get out the way, as we saw in that video of uh, Prada and, and Ineos, was the fact is if they were doing, I don't know, six knots, that, that maneuver would have probably been okay because they would have had enough time to get in at them. But because they were going so fast, because they needed so much more time to get out the way, that, that, that bubble uh, that protects the, the the port boat, as it were, the boat the boat should be keeping clear, gets much much bigger. But I think they're the only the only additions. It's not to change the rule; it's just the way in which you um, umpires will perceive them and, and apply them. Also, okay, Howard. Must be. Uh, it's interesting to think of how they judge mm -hmm. that um, you know distance. I guess you get used to it, but I, I imagine they have all sorts of devices too that give them an idea if they can actually clear or not. You know. Yeah, I mean, they all have vectors, they are the GPS, they have all those different things on and it's, it's all about, it's, it's feel as well. And actually, if you saw that, that video, um, the tactician was like, bear away, you need to come down. So umpires will be watching that. It's, it's, it's much easier on a dinghy when it's a tiller because you could just see them push it away or pull it towards them a little bit. But, you know, those boats moving so fast, um, they need to be able to give them. It. And Ben and, and Giles, when they're coming in there, they're going, we're clear ahead here and we know we're clear ahead. They're gonna try a little Hollywood. They're gonna try and come down and, 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 and fool the umpires. Um, and they knew they weren't gonna turn. And in fact, you could hear Ben go up, up. And by coming up, they increase their boat speed that then allows them to, to get that little squeeze ahead because they know that the Italians were bearing away, decreasing their speed. The, the, the Brits needed to luff up a little bit to increase that speed. So it's, it, Yes, it's very difficult. It, the skill is unbelievable. Um, but in the end, they get so used to these boats moving at those speed and the umpires are very used to how far they are. It's just, it's like if you were to talk to Lewis Hamilton driving his Formula One car, you think nothing of it. If you were to sit in a Formula One car, you'd like crash into a bush straight away. So it's, yeah. it's one of those things that, that, that comes with time. Any other, other questions? Question is, uh, why is team racing preferred to fleet racing for high school and college levels? Uh, it's to do with uh, a couple of things. One is that you don't need to take your boats with you. Um, the reason that we got into it at my last school is that, in fact, we used to trail around like uh, we used to take uh, four 29ers on a big trailer, lots of pack up, lots of lots of uh, pack away. It took forever and a day. It was it was a nightmare. Um, but to go to a regatta down the road takes an hour to get there. You get eight, nine, ten races in a day and you don't have to take anything with you. OK, so it's much easier to get to places. The other thing is, is that you get a lot more out of it. You know, you're getting six, seven, eight races. It's not just like you're at the back of the fleet getting thumped all day long. And especially if you play something called a Swiss League, which is which comes from a chess where everyone plays everyone and the winners go and play each other, and the losers go and play each other. And, and eventually you end up racing against the teams of your same ability. You get a lot more racing in. The racing tends to be a lot fairer. Um, and... And it's really good fun. And actually for kids, you know, we've all gone sailing and you've had a bad day and you've sat at the back of the fleet all day. It can be really demoralizing. Whereas actually, if you go team racing, if you race eight times, you're invariably going to win one or two of those races. And even if you lose a race, you might have pulled off a couple of awesome mark traps. So it's the reason it's there is it's it's quick, it's fast, it's fun, and boats don't need to move around a lot. You can come over to the vineyard from Dartmouth and, and, uh, and um, Barnstable and have a great team racing afternoon. So is it is it eight races is the uh, number you do normally? No, that's, that's it. So in the UK, when we had, um, and actually I think we had it at uh, the Mark and the Turk as well, you're looking at two round robins. So you've got 
Uh, well, we have eight teams. You've got seven races, so you could end up with 14 races in a day. Uh, it just depends how big the fleet is. But if you're if your race officer, your start guys on it with two, Andrew Burr and I are always like slamming on about getting two minute starts going on rather than three minutes. Because if you think about it, if you've got 130 races in a day, if you're doing three minute starts rather than two minute starts, that's 130 minutes. That's a lot of time. I mean, you can watch a third of a Lord of the Rings movie in 130 minutes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of time. So you can spit it out. You can get all those races going. And at the end of the day, it's all about getting kids on the water and enjoying themselves and, and, and applying rules and, and how they do it. And actually, if you look, I had in the UK two very good oppie sailors, two very, very good oppie sailors. We got them into team racing and their performance within oppie sailing went up, not because they got any faster, but because they understood how to apply the rules better in a tight position. So when we're looking at training skills, be them physical or mental, you're looking at applying pressure to a skill. So a skill starts off with, um, okay, I need to, I need to learn how to tack. Okay. I know what I'm doing. And it becomes automatic. And the only way it becomes automatic is by applying more pressure. Okay. Tack faster, tack on the whistle, tack in, uh, in, in waves. Okay. Tack near someone. So it's that kind of idea. And if you're applying pressure to your understanding, your cognitive ability of applying rules at the same time as trying to drive the boat, then when it comes to being in a world's fleet of 200 boats on the line and you find yourself in a bit of pickle you understand where you can put yourself nice any um, any further questions i think that might be it so thanks everyone for coming um to the sale martha's vineyard uh, winter lecture series the next one coming up again march 10th uh to be announced watch for your emails coming in and uh, be sure to renew your CLMV membership for 2021. Uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. If you do have any questions, just email me and I'll, I'll, I'm more than happy to uh, email you back or you're more than welcome to come down to the boathouse on a sunny day in May and see us racing around. So uh, we'd, lo we'd love to see you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Thank Andy. You. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Hi, Mom. Hey, thanks. <laughs>